So our program tonight is with Andy Smith, Talking Turkey. He did this program like maybe what, 15 or so years ago. And the reason we're repeating it tonight is because back then we were not recording our programs. And I have a number of Thanksgiving related programs and this was an aching hole in our, our, our all their different presentations. So I just had to fix that. In addition, I want to point out the very first culinary historians meeting I ever went to was September 1995, and Andy was the presenter on ketchup. And I have to say, I laughed myself silly driving into Chicago to see a program on ketchup, but he sold me, and I've been coming to programs ever since. You were the first, Andy. I did it. I Do I claim credit, or, or is everybody going to blame me now? <laughs> I think a bit of both. Depends okay. on how you how you know me. And we have Scott. Scott Warner is here tonight. I see you, Scott. Where's Scott? I Scott. Scott's, Scott's under his I see Scott. pseudonym. He's under okay. Elizabeth Sidney. Yes, his uh, significant other. Um. So anyway, Andy, I'm going to. Well, should I, do you want your biography, or does it really matter? No, it doesn't really. Okay, matter. so so we'll just he's, let. We're he's gonna, a nice guy. He he is, and I'm going to put your outline after you do your introductory remarks. How's that? That's good enough. Okay. Now, want, I, 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 Kathy wanted me to tell the story about when my book, uh, The Turkey, uh, an American story, first came out, which was about 15 years ago. And um, I, I tried to do presentations around the country, and I tried to go to small uh, places where I knew that there were uh, farmers um, growing turkeys, not not the industrial turkeys, but the other turkeys. And I went around to a number, did a number of presentations, and they all went very well. I went into one place, and um, when the time came for the presentation, there was only one person in the audience. <laughs> so I, I got down from the podium and went over to him and said, listen, I'm, I'm really sorry. Uh, I don't know what happened. Somebody must have gotten things confused because there's nobody here. And so, uh, you know, thank you for coming. And, and he looked at me very uh, seriously. He said, I, I'm a farmer and I do raise uh, turkeys on my farm. Um, and if only one turkey shows up uh, to feed her, I feed her. I got the message. So I proceeded back to the podium. And for the next hour and a half, I talked about uh, turkeys. And uh, I wanted to know how he responded. He stayed there the entire time. I would have continued talking anyway, so it doesn't really matter. So I went down to him and I said, well, uh, how did you, uh, you know, like the presentation? He said, well, you know, uh, I, I am a, a, a farmer. I do raise turkeys. I, I do feed my uh, turkeys every morning. And if one turkey shows up, uh, I, I feed it. But I don't give it the whole load. So I, all I can do is say, uh, Kathy uh, told me not to give the whole load tonight. I've got a presentation that will only go four hours. So uh, don't <laughs> worry about it. Uh, and we'll go from there. All right. All right. Uh, so now, 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 Andy, by the way, is presenting from St. Thomas in the Caribbean. Uh, it's and that's I understand uh, it's about as cold here as it is there. It's 72 there in Chicago. Is that about right? Yeah, well, oh, today it, sure. it's really cold here. It got down to 78 degrees last night, and that's one of the coldest nights that we've had in a long time. So just uh, you think, you know, Chicago and St. Thomas are about the same. Okay, so per Andy's request, we're going to put the outline of the talk instead of looking at Andy. Correct. Oh, yeah, that would be better. I can't, for whatever reason, I can't get my video to work. Okay. Okay. So, so we're going to talk about real wild turkey, not the bourbon, but the, the wild turkey itself. Um, it originated in the Americas, um, uh, in particularly Central America, sometime about 11 million years ago, and it has survived and thrived uh, throughout that period of time. There are two major species of uh, wild turkeys. Uh, one is the oscillated turkey, which lives in uh, Yucatan and lives in Belize and a few other places. It's never been uh, domesticated, and uh, it is a bit smaller than the turkey that we know and love. Um, and so um, that's the second turkey, which just happens to be the Meliagris uh, galopavo. Uh, it it uh, was domesticated and estimated about 
2,300 to 600 years ago. Why archaeologists can't determine how long it's been domesticated is because the bones of the domesticated turkey at that time were very similar to the bones of the undomesticated turkey. So they've got bones, but they don't know whether or not they were domesticated. They make the assumption about that period of time. They were domesticated in uh, Mexico. Now, uh, for those of you that don't know about wild turkeys, they can fly. Um, they can um, uh, zoom up to uh, you know a couple hundred feet. Uh, there are uh, they weigh anywhere from about twenty. Uh, an adult turkey weighs anywhere from about twenty pounds uh, to uh, some estimates are sixty pounds. You can imagine a sixty-pound turkey flying around. Uh, now, in in terms of domestication, there were a lot of reasons on why they were domesticated. Uh, all of us love the meat. Yes, is that true? Everybody loves the turkey meat. Nobody's right. Nobody's nodding. Okay. Um, so, um, but but that's not the only reason on why they were domesticated. One of the most important ones happens to be feathers. Do all of you uh, use turkey feathers? None of you seem to be using turkey feathers. All right, five thousand turkey feathers. All right, five thousand feathers are on a single turkey, a large turkey. And they were used for a whole series of things. Um, I mean, obviously they were used uh, for um, making clothing. They were used for uh, the, um, on arrows. Um, they were used on uh, to, to make all sorts of things. They were also, by the way, uh, they were used for uh, purposes of telling somebody you didn't like them. You just cut off the head of the turkey and sent it to somebody. And that was the indication that you really didn't like them. I haven't gotten any of those turkeys lately. Uh, so um, I hope that you haven't uh, either. But there was lots of different purposes on why uh, uh, turkeys were domesticated and, and what they were used for. Uh, and uh, the bones are another part to it. The bones were used to make tools. They were made for jewelry. Uh, or a whole series of things. So there were lots of reasons on why uh, turkeys were domesticated and used for, used of them in uh, uh, archeological times. Uh, the Europeans, the best evidence that Europeans ran into turkeys was not until 1519. And that's when uh, Hernan Cortez went into uh, to, uh, Mexico and particularly uh, into uh, Aztec areas. Uh, and they arrived back in uh, Europe they were almost immediately adopted in Europe. Um, and uh, the adoption was for a lot of reasons, but one, they were a lot bigger than all the other birds that they had. Um, and then secondly, they were similar to other birds, the peafowl particularly, and the guinea fowl. Uh, the, the peafowl was the hot little number of, of Renaissance Europe. Uh, if you if you had a peacock, uh, it, it's not the meat, although they did serve it in huge in huge uh, banquets and things of that sort. But it was for the the feathers themselves were the hot hot reason on why they became popular. So those were some of the reasons on why um, turkeys were adopted very quickly in Europe. Uh, England was the last to uh, last main European country to actually have acquired uh, turkeys and. There have been a big debate as to why English called them turkeys, and there's a lots of different excuses given. One of them because um, they they believed that the turkey actually came from Turkey uh, at that point, the Ottoman Empire. Uh, but uh, there are other reasons that are given out there, and no one's really come up with a good one. Uh, but the turkey again was much larger than any of the other birds that they had. It had a lot more meat on it. And you could herd turkeys, at least domesticated turkeys can't fly very well. So it's possible to herd them. And that's exactly what they did. To take them to market, you would just herd them along a road. And then at night, you'd have to have a dog to keep all of the turkeys together in a single location. And then they would move into wherever they were going to sell them. So they had a lot of advantages. A lot of meat was number one. Um, they were easy to raise. Uh, number two, they, they're omnivores. They eat every almost anything. So there's lots of different reasons on, on why uh, turkeys took off in Europe. Uh, when uh, Europeans came to America, there were domesticated turkeys, not just in Mexico, but also throughout the American Southwest and into Canada, all the way up to Ontario. So there were turkeys that were there, both wild as well as domesticated. Um, the, the problem with the domesticated turkey early on was that it was uh, only 20 pounds in weight. 
and the wild turkeys weighed a lot more. So if you really wanted a good turkey dinner, what you would do is you would go after um, the, the um, a wild turkey rather than the turkey that you had in, uh, had in your yard. Uh, English settlements all reported that there were turkeys um, uh, from Jamestown to Plymouth. Uh, so they were, they were consumed. Uh, there is this big story going about uh, that um, Benjamin Franklin wanted to proclaim the turkey as the national bird. Did anybody hear this story? Um, that's a nice story. It's not true. Um, he did write in a letter five uh, years after the eagle had been our, declared our national bird. Um, he said he, think, he thought that should have been the turkey because that was a true American bird and the eagle wasn't. So uh, that's one of the stories. A lot of the other stories, a couple of the other ones that we're going to be discussing are not uh, true. I, I love Thanksgiving. How many of you love Thanksgiving? It's, it's the one holiday that it's not religious, it's not political, it's family oriented. And I can have so many recollections of um, uh, dining with family uh, with, and, and with friends. And I think that's for me one of the special reasons on on why um, I, I I like Thanksgiving and it's taken off such uh, success. Uh, there were many days of Thanksgiving in colonial America, so uh, the part of the problem with those days is uh, that um, uh, the, the, the days of Thanksgiving were not necessarily days that you would consume any food. They were holy days that you would spend in church, particularly those Puritans. Uh, there were days that you would pray. There were days that you would um, maybe sh share a little food with somebody, but it would not be a national meal. Um, and uh, that's that's one of the myths that we'll deal with a little earlier on. And certainly the pilgrims, um, although they certainly do have a time in which they do get together and they do consume fowl, quote unquote, with American Indians, um, there was not recognized as a day of Thanksgiving and hasn't been historically thereafter. Uh, George Washington did declare um, Thanksgiving on uh, eight, 1789 uh, and for the fourth uh, Thursday in uh, November. So uh, th there is that one time, but again, it wasn't necessarily a day of consuming it. Now, the pilgrims have been discussed um, at, at length, and I'll go through it again. The pilgrims did have days of Thanksgiving. They were religious. They were spent in church. They did have a, a time in which they had a meal with American Indians, um, and uh, but that was an un, 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 uh, unusual meal. Uh, and most of the other days of Thanksgiving, the pilgrims had did not have food associated with them at all. Uh, but in uh, the 1840s, there is a, a, a person who comes along and declares that this was the first Thanksgiving in, eight, in 1620 that the pilgrims had it, and that's the first Thanksgiving in America. And uh, that would not have been um, taken up uh, extensively, except for Sarah Josepha Hale. She wrote uh, a really great novel in the 1820s, and um, when uh, she became uh, the um, when, when she be, took over Gotti's Ladies Book, uh, there were 10,000 subscribers and uh, uh, within a few years there were 100, 150,000 subscribers which in the in the mid 19th century was an awful lot of people and so she began a campaign to have Thanksgiving declared a national holiday uh, but she couldn't get anybody uh, any president interested so she went to each of the governors of each of the states and for a 20-year period of time prior to the Civil War, she contacted them all, asked them all to declare Thanksgiving on the fourth Thursday um, of November. And uh, just before the Civil War, she got most, almost all of the state governors to declare it and such. She, she was opposed to slavery, but her real hope was that Thanksgiving might pull the country together. Uh, but uh, as you know from history, Civil War broke out. Uh, she was unable to communicate with the governors of uh, the Southern states, uh, but she did go to, uh, to one of the uh, cabinet secretaries and ask him to approach um, Lincoln to declare a day of Thanksgiving, which he did on the fourth Thursday of the month. And by the way, at that time, there were only two uh, national holidays. One was George Washington's birthday and the other one 
was the 4th of July. There were no other national holidays in America at the time. And so one of the reasons on why she was uh, encouraging people to declare Thanksgiving would be a fall holiday. Um, the Christmas was not declared a holiday until after that period of time. So you have, you have these things going on. The first time that uh, Sarah Josepha Hale mentions the Pilgrims and Thanksgiving is after the American Civil War. Um, so it really was not an important part of the declaration from initially, and nor, nor was it a reason, uh, nor was it a particularly important uh, reason on why they uh, did it. Uh, the first day of Thanksgiving, of course, had been in Jamestown, uh, but after the American Civil War, the, the southern states were not able to really influence things that were going on immediately after the war. So um, that has become our national myth about the pilgrims. I like the myth, though. It's a great myth, and I hope you enjoy it, too. Can you go down, Kathy? Um, OK. Uh, most of us eat industrialized turkey. Everybody eat industrialized turkey? Nobody's raising their hand. Nobody's nodding. All right. Um, all I can do is say uh, industrialized turkey, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier on, the domesticated turkey was smaller than the wild turkey. So for a prolonged period of time, it was the wild turkey that really people wanted. Uh, you can easily catch wild turkey, by the way, if you want to know. Uh, you can't catch them during the day because they'll fly away. At night, all you need is a pole with a little rope on the end of it. Uh, they have they can't see anything at night. They live in trees. All you got to do is take your pole with your rope and grab them and bring them down. And that's exactly what large, large numbers of people did. Then you had the broad-breasted bronze, which was uh, uh, created by an Englishman who went to Canada. And for uh, that period of time on, it was huge breast, which is typical of the um, most of those, the turkeys that we eat in the store. Uh, it has shifted now to the broad-breasted white uh, in terms of color. Now, there's lots of problems with the broad-breasted white. How many of you are going to cook a broad-breasted white for turkey? Um, none of you are, none of you, nobody's interested in this raising this. Come on, you got to raise your hand, show you're really excited by this. Okay, I got Kathy saying it, that's good enough. All right, so the problem uh, is, of course, that the, the breast meat is extremely thick, which is why most of us go and buy them. And the, the problem is that um, if you cook it, you really uh, will find it becomes very dry on the outside before the inside is cooked. So the end result is what you really have to do is put something in it, and that's how turkeys became larded. Now, in my humble opinion, and you can all disagree with me when the comments open up, uh, broad-breasted white turkey meat has virtually no flavor, and it's really the lard that's put in the turkey underneath the skin that actually does give it some uh, flavor. Um, the other aspects to it, of course, are you've got um, your gravy, you've got your turkey gravy, and you've got your um, other other things that you can add flavor to it, and that's part of it. Um, for your information, virtually 99.9% of all turkeys consumed in America at Thanksgiving time uh, are uh, raised in factory-like warehouses. Um, within the first four days of a time a turkey is born, uh, they are de-beaked, uh, their toes are cut off, um, and they're de-snotted, and there's a whole series of other things that happen to them. And the reason is, is because turkeys that are together will peck each other and they will scratch each other. And so the goal is for industrial farmers to, to make sure that that doesn't happen. Again, my opinion on the flavor is that the store-bought turkey is not that flavorful. Uh, now, uh, how many of you know about the, how many of you have broken a wishbone, a turkey wishbone? Anybody? Only, Kathy's only, nobody else is raising a hand. All right, come on, this is something really important. You got to get out there. All right, I got another person, to, a couple other people raise their hand. This goes back at least to the 15th century, having nothing to do with turkeys, having to do with birds like the turkey that were in fact raised. And it is magic. Uh, in other words, that was what was considered. The turkey, the turkey bone happens to be bigger than the other one, so it was took over the uh, it took over the, uh, the, the belief that uh, if you break a turkey wishbone and you win, then you got your wish is going to be completed. I, I, when I did win, I never really got my wish completed, but maybe some of you did. Anybody, come on, raise your hands if you get yours. Nobody, nobody else is raising it. All right, that really goes back a long way. Turkey in the straw. Uh, how many of you have hummed turkey in the straw? How many of you have heard turkey in the straw? 
early 19th century is when the turkey and the straw started off. So it was really uh, something that uh, has been around for a long time. Any of you do the turkey trot? Nobody do the turkey. Come on, you got to do the turkey trot. Let's do it right. Uh, Ragtime, early 20th century, hot little number. Uh, and now they do turkey trots every Thanksgiving. Did none of you have heard about the turkey trot? None of you run a turkey trot? They're they're actually a race that's in the in the, in the at least on Thanksgiving Day. Um, there's lots of stuff uh, to um, pardons. Um, who really pardoned the first turkey is up uh, up for up a real question. It is true that in the 19th century, turkey producers began to give turkeys to the president and they would get visibility when they did it. Uh, who precisely pardoned the first presidential turkey is, is unclear. Uh, some say it was Roosevelt, some say it was Truman, some say it was Kennedy, some say it was Bush. So all, in any case, uh, you can uh, absolutely guarantee that on the turkey day, there's gonna be at least one turkey that's going to receive a presidential pardon. Uh, so you, I'm sure you're all going to be looking forward to that. Now, uh, un unfortunately, uh, turkeys now are 8% higher in cost uh, than they were last year. Part of it's due to inflation, but the other part's due to uh, bird flu. Bird flu has affected large numbers of, uh, um, of, of the uh, poultry and, uh, that we eat. Um, and in this case, uh, the best estimate is like seven to eight percent of the turkeys that would normally have been available have now passed away due to turkey and bird flu. I could really talk on and I really want to give you a chance to talk uh, and I look forward to your comments. Mark. All righty. Well, here, let me just start with what's already here. Um, how is the turkey able to eat if it's de been debunked, de uh, de de beaked? And the answer is they can, they can have they have a partial only the sharp part of the beak is cut off at the at the tip, so the, they can still consume. They can still pick things up into the mouth and eat it. So uh, Gina Hunter, who's one of your authors. I think it was on insects, eating insects. Yes. Uh, I'll buy a heritage bird if I can afford it this year, but I hear turkeys up 23% higher cost this year. Right. The, the best estimate that I could find, and I looked, at, looked it up yesterday, was 8% for industrial uh, uh, turkeys. But I would imagine that the, um, that, uh, the, the ones that are raised in small farms, in fact, are, do deal, uh, that cost a lot more. And again, part of the problem is the supply. How do you get them from one place to another? So there's lots of issues that are associated with that. Um, must read by Andy Zach, Zombie Turkeys. It's on Amazon. You will laugh until you cry. I've never heard of that. Have you? No. <laughs> oh, well, there's a lot of other things with a turkey. How many of you are bowlers? Anybody go into bowling? If you had three strikes in a row, not three strikes, if you've had three, knock all the pins down three times in a row, that's a turkey in bowling. So how many of you, none of you are into bowling either. Okay, another question. Uh, well, I can also tell you um, in, in the Chicago area, and I'm sure somewhere uh, is not alone, there's a turkey testicle festival. Yeah. And you can, and basically uh, I went, uh, Peter Angler's here too. We we went together and it was really a biker reunion. <laughs> Beer and fried turkey testicles. We were the only ones not dressed in black. We, you know, we looked odd just by wearing color. <laughs> uh, that I've not heard of. I'm writing that down and I'll I'll quote you, uh, Kathy. So uh, the, uh, the biker you know, part, the color part. I revised the book, <laughs> you're, you're, you'll be in it. <laughs> so, uh, Robert, Robert Staley oh, yeah. said, why are domestic turkeys smaller than their wild cousins, and why are most domesticated white when the wild ones are brown? Uh, historically, the domesticated turkeys were uh, only about 20 pounds, and you had wild turkeys that were typically up to 40 or 50 or 60 pounds. Uh, today, the broad-breasted whites are, in fact, uh, if if they are permitted to uh, survive, th they can be up to 30, uh, 20 or 30 pounds. So it's they're not really not that much difference today between domesticated and um, the industrialized uh, undomesticated turkeys. 
Oh, Susanna points out my supermarket sells turkey tails. Have you tried it? No, I haven't tried it. I have to tell you, my dad and I fight over the turkey tail. So one year I did buy extra turkey tails and roasted them with the turkey. He, he said it was too much of a good thing. Hey, that's a good title for a book, Turkey Tales. <laughs> yes, I think you're right. Uh, more important, and how did they taste? I don't know if she's talking about which turkey, the domesticated, the wild. Is there much of a difference? Between yes, the wild I, I, and to, the... to, total difference in taste. So I would encourage you to give a, if you have an opportunity to get a wild turkey at some point, um, go ahead and do it. Or, but the turkeys that are raised on small farms are also totally different than those that are industrial, that are that are produced in huge industrial operations. And by the way, they have uh, eight to 10,000 turkeys in a particular room and they may have you know 10 rooms. Um, obviously they don't get a lot of attention. Stuffing or dressing? Uh, it's southern or northern, which which I've never quite understood because my family always said stuffing, and where and my grandfathers were from the south, so that might well have been the reason. So as far as I know, that's the north south divide. Well, at the at the Illinois State Fair, we had somebody who uh, put their dressing into a pan, patted it flat, and baked it. Uh, Penelope said, uh, and she's right. Turkey tails, also known as the part that goes over the fence last. Um, and in my family, it's also referred to as the Pope's nose. The Pope's nose, okay. <laughs> uh, Carrie Tilly, by the way, pointed out, she, she referenced the uh, lyrics from 1776. Uh, the turkey is the truly noble bird, Native American, source of sustenance of our original settlers, an incredibly brave fellow, who will not flinch at attacking a regiment of Englishmen single-handedly. Therefore, the national bird of America is going to be the eagle. That's it. It's going to be the eagle. <laughs> <laughs> the bald eagle. It's not just any old eagle. It's the bald eagle. Yes. And it's actually, I, I, I actually bumped into one. They, they have nests around the uh, Mississippi River. They also have nests in Lake County where I live. And it's really cool to unexpectedly come upon a bald eagle just swooping past you, you know. Hey, Scott, do you want to say something? Yeah, come on, Scott. Uh, let me, uh, let me, uh, you could mute if you'd like. Sorry, there he the goes. TV's Hi, on Scott. in the background. Oh, I couldn't change my name because I think you have the name changed. Yeah, you're oh. right, you're right, my fault. Okay, but I'm not Elizabeth Sidney, I'm Scott Warner. Um, Actually, what you what what did you want me to comment on? Oh, we just wanted to hear your cheerful thoughts on turkeys. Wait, you've never had um, a, you've never had an opportunity that you haven't said something. Well, except I told Kathy I always have things written down because I'm not an imp improviser. So <laughs> I I would never make it at Second City in Chicago imp improvising on stage. Um, and no, I uh, the only thing I can think of is. Um, I think you might have covered this. How do you get uh, a tasty chick, a turkey breast? You know, because you're saying that the, uh, I mean, you know, they're so bland tasting. What, yes. What do you do to? Uh, maybe like, somebody. Maybe it's like uh, fish. Maybe other people. I mean, they the, say, the, how do you get the fishy stink out of fish? And the the instructor, the cooking the, chef, the, the cooking instructor say, buy fresh fish. Um, so how how do you get a, a tasty? chicken a turkey breast at thanksgiving where do you get, go to get one if you're going to get an industrialized turkey then you, it, obviously it's larded to begin with. most of them are larded so you've got a little flavor that's in there and then uh, for me i put cranberries on top <laughs> i put turkey um you know you put you put um, uh, gravy on top you put whatever flavoring that you like but because the because the breast has essentially no taste from industrialized turkey then you can put any flavor that you want on it, and that's in it. that's in the end what you get. That's well, my humble I, opinion. Some of you may disagree. Yeah, but once uh, years ago, I got from some turkey farm where they were supposed to be the real thing, yeah. and the breast was so tough. Uh, you know, you needed a hacksaw 
to eat it. So I guess you can't win. So I'll go back to what I was doing, which is what you're doing. Try to flavor that big breasted thing as much as you can from yeah. outside sources. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's my, but other people say they have other, there've been a number of other people making recommendations and suggestions. Briny, it works. Buttermilk brine. Um, not really larded. They're injected with vegetable broth and salt. If you buy a natural, non-injected turkey, you can brine it. I have brined the turkey that was 49 cents a pound at Jewel. And by the way, uh, the last couple of years, I've actually put the turkey frozen into the oven on Thanksgiving. It takes about 50% longer, but I don't have to deal with the mess of uh, defrosting it in the refrigerator for the next week. Ah, Cajun deep fried turkey. Oh, can I tell you my Cajun deep fried turkey story? So Thanks. I have a I have a friend who made a uh, one of those Cajun deep fried turkey. Her sister in law showed up, took one look, and left and went to Applebee's for a real Thanksgiving dinner. And she said, if I had known that, we would have had a deep fried turkey earlier. The sister left. Well, we have a number of really good uh, suggestions on where you could get um, a, uh, you know, a, a non-industrialized turkey in the local area around Chicago. Yes, uh, the Hoka Turkey, which is the Howard Kaufman Turkey Farm in Waterman, Illinois. It's in the western, it's west of Chicago. Um, Jacqueline suggests put turkey in roaster with one bottle of white wine, cook lightly with, oh, cover lightly with oil and herbs, cook slowly, tightly overnight at 250. This will poach and tenderize your turkey. Cover with your favorite herbs. <sighs> I think my family will be very happy with my whatever I do. Uh, any other stories or things that people advice they would like to offer? It looks like we overwhelmed them with information. I can see it. They're, everyone's so excited. They can, you, can, you know, it's really difficult for <laughs> them to... <laughs> So I see uh, there's a Peter here. I bet it's the Peter I know. Are you going to ask us about Peter, uh, turkey and pizza? It's a challenge. He's a pizza expert. Let's hear it. Oh, okay. by the way, Charlotte, Charlotte Draper. Do you want to talk by Charlotte here? Yeah, she was. Um, she works. Uh, she works for Butterball during the season. She answers questions, but I don't see her. Maybe she had to take off. Oh, I missed her. Okay, and there's turkey meatball soup. Well, that's cool. Um, anything else that people would like to share? Ah, oh, Penelope. Let Penelope. Yeah, we'll let Penelope. She's done a talk. She's one of my uh, talks for the um, our stable of uh, turkey related talks. You could unmute yourself, Penelope. I was trying and it didn't work until just now. Yep. Uh, well, I can share what my, my mother in law's way to, to, and of course, I have to tell you that she would say things like, well, I know other people do it in different ways but they're wrong. So <laughs> as a New Englander, dyed in the wool New Englander, her way of cooking turkey was to cover it with or, or range on the top, particularly on the breast, sort of fans of salt pork, um, which gave a lot, you know, would melt. Uh, it was a kind of an outside larding kind of, thing, literally larding because it was pork. Uh, and, and the other alternative is to, it was cheesecloth over the breast in particular, that you kept soaked in butter. And both of those give a rather nice flavor, particularly in the skin. So. Did you baste a lot? Yeah. Yeah. When I was an early turkey maker, I basted a lot. I stopped because you, the, the oven temperature would drop and then by the time it recovered, I'm opening the door for another round. Well, with salt pork, you don't need to, to, to baste because as it melts in the heat of the, the oven, it, you know, the, the fat drips over the thing and it comes out a lovely color as well. But, you know, what the best is tends to be what someone you love 
the way someone you love made it. And a, a, a friend who was a caterer told me a story of a friend of hers whose husband's mother had died um, before they met and, and he missed her Thanksgiving turkey so much. And every year the wife would try to uh, recreate it. You know, the, he'd tell her what he remembered and she'd do, and he'd take a bite and then it was just never right. And one day, one Thanksgiving, she forgot that she left the turkey in the oven and it was royally overcooked. And what do you do? You don't have a spare in the refrigerator that you can just whip out. So she served it. And she watched as her husband took a bite and got this beatific smile on his face. It was just like his mother's. You know? So even overcooked turkey will be the, the best if that's what your mother or someone else you love made. So true. So true. Um, Carrie Tilly pointed out, well, I guess this is the joy of turkey is the leftovers. And she makes turkey tetrazzini. Mm. And somebody makes a stuffed turkey breast ballotine. Um, eagle is appropriate for a national bird because it will always steal another bird's catch instead of hunting its own if possible. <laughs> and Peter rose to the challenge. U.S. troops had pizza in Rome for Thanksgiving in 1945. 1945. <laughs> uh, Peter is a pizza historian, so he usually comes up with a question or an anecdote that is pizza related. Uh, sourdough bread turkey sandwiches. Yeah, well, you know, with cranberry sauce and stuffing. Any other questions? Yes, Penelope. Oh, you, you unmuted yourself. Here, go ahead. Um, just the quartermaster corps has gone to, you know, has considered it an absolute necessity that every service person have a turkey dinner on Thanksgiving. And at the same time as your dinner in Turkey dinner in Rome in 45, there was one place that they had to do where the, all the bridges had been destroyed and the troops were across the river from where the turkeys were. And the story is that they put them in waterproof bags and hurled them across the river just to get them to the troops. So it, it, was, it was taken very seriously that every American soldier or sailor had to have turkey for Thanksgiving. How can you have Thanksgiving without a turkey? Come on, that's a, that's crucial. And if, and if you're, you know, if you're fighting for democracy, it's even, the American it's even more way, important. That's it's right. even more important. Yes. Sharla, do you wish to unmute and talk to us about turkey experiences? I see now you're here. No, if she's able to, I don't know. But anyway. Anybody else? Otherwise, we may be turkeyed out, which is almost impossible. Oh, there's some. Ah, uh, last year my sister thought I was cooking the turkey. I thought she was cooking the turkey. We had a large feast of sides, and we remember it as the year without a turkey. <laughs> the, the year without a turkey. I like that. That's good. Because <laughs> the sides is really what you what is you know what everybody goes for. Well, I, ah, ah, oh, 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 okay. It's Scott, Scott, go ahead. I am just, uh, just want to add something that I, years ago, I read an article in the Tribune in the food section. I think it was by Jean Marie Brownson, who's such an authority on food and was the test kitchen director there for years. And I think she uh, pointed out how many compliments she got for a turkey one year from her family how delicious it was and they asked her what she did to make it so good she said it was the turkey it wasn't me and I've kind of found that out too sometimes the, one of the best turkeys I ever had was years ago was on sale at Jewel for 29 cents a pound and I kept it in the freezer for six months and I thought I better use it or throw it out or maybe I'll have to throw it out after I cook it 
And that was one of the most flavorful, juicy turkeys I ever had. It wasn't me who made it that way. So God only knows, I guess, why, why a turkey tastes good. So uh, I'll just add that comment and unmute un myself. Or as they say, go mute yourself, I will. <laughs> Well, I, unless somebody comes up with something else, I think we're about done. But Andy, I will send you the chat so that you can you can read this and catch all these little anecdotes that I might have forgotten to convey. Thank you. And we wish you a happy Thanksgiving. I wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving. I love Thanksgiving, despite what I said. I really love it. It's a wonderful day. And, and do you get Thanksgiving in St. Thomas? I mean, do you get oh, a turkey? We're going, be, we're going to be celebrating Thanksgiving, uh, yes, and obviously with a turkey, but uh, it will be an industrialized turkey. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. You know, it's a turkey, right? Right. That's, that's it. All right. Well, thank you, Andy. Thank you. And happy Thanksgiving to you and your family. And, and to everybody else, too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.